Hello, my name is Jay Chauhan. I'm a mentor at the Angel Mentorship Group. And I have uh, Shalaka Gujar, who is a member of the Bar of Ontario and has been a member of the Bar also in Maharashtra, India. And the subject for today is how to give advice in two different jurisdictions, because a lot of the clients that we might have today um, have recently moved or are moving from one country to the other and their properties may be in one country and uh, their loyalties and their affiliations and connections and families are in another country. So when you advise these clients, what is it that we do to advise them is our topic of the day. So with that in mind, I am happy to see you Sharaka on this program. And uh, if you can give your introduction as to which jurisdictions where you call to the bar and then what you have done so far here and what have you done in the Indian jurisdiction as well, it will be interesting for the audience to know. Then I'll give a little introduction of myself and then we'll talk on different topics. Sure, sir. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity. So uh, my name is Shalaka Guzer. I'm basically from India, Mumbai. And uh, I have uh, I was called to bar in Mumbai uh, in 20, uh, 2009. Uh, I practiced in India for about uh, almost uh, near about 12 years and uh, then we moved to Canada. Uh, I was called to the bar in Canada in 2022 uh, by, uh, by uh, Law Society of Ontario. Now I'm practicing uh, civil and um, commercial litigation and family law in Ontario. So uh, in India also, I practiced civil litigation, um, mainly civil litigation. So uh, I have my my uh, area of practice is uh, revolving around a civil civil and uh, um, family law. Uh, I would like to continue doing uh, so so that you know um, I can help people, uh, and I would also like to help the people who are willing to come to Canada and establish their practice in Canada. Um, so that I can, I would like to share my experience so that they can probably gain some, um, if, th if that helps it, helps them. So I will be more than happy to do that. Excellent. I think you, you also have some very good lawyers that you work with and had top experience in India. Can you talk about that? I think you were acting also as a lawyer in court system in uh, Bombay or, or Mumbai, in, uh, which is a state of Maharashtra where you were also uh, in the law firm of the Solicitor General of India, am I correct? Yes, he was an additional Solicitor General of India and uh, uh, I practiced with him, uh, Mr. Kevik Settlewad. Uh, I practiced with him uh, in his chambers. I was attached to his chambers. Um, I was fortunate enough that he gave me this opportunity and uh, uh, to work with him uh, because uh, in the, obviously in the uh, Office of Solicitor, uh, so uh, additional solicitor, you usually get um, uh, get a lot of exposure to constitutional matters and different types of uh, matters and very high stake litigation, uh, which which actually helps. Uh, I mean, it helps uh, you to grow as a professional. So um, I was very fortunate enough uh, to work with uh, Mr. Settlewell. Now, you had excellent experience, Shalaka, in India. And now the question is that how do we apply that experience in this jurisdiction, actually? See, one of the things that I have encountered in my long years of experience in Ontario jurisdiction is that the foreign expense is very often not acknowledged, actually. So I want to talk about that subject in, in, uh, in this video for the benefit of lawyers who are in transition and also the public that can be potentially your clients as to how they can get advice so that we are able to function effectively in two jurisdictions, you know, that's what we'll address. So, but let me give you my introduction for, for you and also for the audience that I am called to the bar in three jurisdictions, which is firstly in England, secondly in Canada, and then thirdly in India. So I have not practiced long enough in India to get the experience, uh, nor do I have practical experience uh, in the Indian jurisdiction, but I've done a number of uh, lectures in the in your town. I've done lecture in the the Indian Merchant Chamber, and I've done lectures in the University of Gujarat in the Gujarat state of Gujarat, and I've also done lecture at the university in the Chandigarh at the university for the entire faculty and the student faculty in that jurisdiction. So I have a reasonable idea of what happens 
And I've been to a number of courts in India where I have some exposure to how the practice is done in those two sections, you know. So I think that uh, my, my background also in the last Chalaka, in my background and last 15 years, I've launched the Angel Mentorship Group where our objective is to help the lawyers who are new lawyers to establish their practices and also be able to assist the clients when they're dealing with other jurisdictions. So currently we have members of the bar like you who are members of two bar associations because each jurisdiction, as you know, is only responsible to train and qualify lawyers in their jurisdiction. But when the migration happens in a large scale, as it's happening in, in Ontario, we have many people who have migrated and, and also have properties in different countries and, and therefore their original home country as well as Canada. And they need the legal advice to ensure that the rights are protected both the jurisdictions. So we have members in our group that you'll eventually get to know who are members of the bar in Hong Kong, in India, in different parts of India. And uh, as you know, India has about 20 languages and, and each bar association uh, will allow you to practice uh, locally in your language. And I'm called the bar in Gujarat. So, and I'm fluent still in Gujarati language. And uh, I think you were called the bar in Maharashtra. So you're probably fluent in, in Marathi. And, and therefore it's important for the audience to realize that India is a very vast country and has many languages. So when you take the case in India, the Supreme Court of India, then we then we all merge into one language. I think it's I think it's Hindi or it's, it's in pure English now. Uh, and I mostly in Bombay High Court and Supreme Court of uh, India, what I've seen is like they are uh, mainly operate in Hindi. Uh, I mean, sorry, in English. Uh, they do not. Uh, I mean, the official language is uh, English only. Yes. Yes. So I think, so let's talk about, uh, uh, I mentioned briefly about the bar associations in uh, in the each jurisdiction which are responsible for discipline function and educational function of the lawyers in that jurisdiction, you know. So I think just very briefly, in Ontario, 1896, roughly, the Law Society of Ontario was founded. And, uh, and then, of course, the Law Society then uh, delegated to the university uh, in 19, roughly 68 or 70, the function of giving the JD degree, which originally was LLB, and it is now JD, Jewish Doctor degree in Ontario. And therefore, anybody who wants now to qualify here from this jurisdiction has to do a JD degree, then the by admission course, and then the discipline function of the, the law society is to discipline the lawyers based on the rules of professional ethics that are governing the body in Ontario. So how does it work in uh, in Maharashtra? In Maharashtra, uh, the, obviously the law governing body is different in every uh, each uh, uh, state. So for example, in um, Maharashtra, it is uh, Maharashtra and Goa, uh, uh, Goa uh, Bar Association of Maharashtra and Goa. Uh, in each state, it is different, but it is also governed by uh, 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 I mean, the central jurisdiction also. So um, usually people are uh, attached to their state jurisdiction if they are, unless they are uh, they are uh, practicing in Supreme Court. Um, you can practice in Supreme Court as a counsel, but if you are, uh, it, it's the, obviously there is two type of practices in uh, India. Uh, it's, it's similar to what happens in UK, solicitor and barrister. So there's something called advocate on record, which is like a mainly, uh, you know, uh, it's a, it's a uh, people you usually file their, um, uh, like what we file is representation here. People usually file their vakalat nama. That's what we call. So vakalat nama, those people who are uh, mainly practice uh, or they are on the advocate on record, uh, who directly in com uh, directly comes in touch with uh, the clients. Uh, they have to get themselves uh, on the Supreme Court, uh, I mean, um, in, uh, on the Supreme Court official, uh, uh, I mean, maybe a, uh, it is a kind of a, a registrar or something. But then otherwise, anybody can practice in Supreme Court as long as they don't need to file a vakalat nama. So that is also a practice in uh, Mumbai High Court. Uh, usually, councils just practice. They do not file their vakalat nama. Uh, somebody else is there on record for them, and usually, councils uh, 
get their dockets and they uh, go to the court and argue the matter. That is what the practice is. I think it's it's similar in UK. So Another unlike thing, Canada. In, in England, uh, the, where I also am a member in the Lincoln Sen, there is a division of the profession into a solicitor who deals with the client and Correct. a barrister who deals with the court system and argues the case in front of the court. So the solicitor gives the brief over to the barrister and then That's he right. takes it to court. So is that the same in India? Exact same. It's exact same. Yeah. So coming to the discipline function, the professional body of the jurisdiction is in the hands of the, the local uh, law society. So how That's does right. that work? Like here, for example, each of the 12 provinces would have their own uh, law society and each is responsible for ensuring that the standard of the, the education of the province is maintained and the provincial laws are also understood by the lawyer in their jurisdiction and also the discipline function is carried out by them and therefore they are responsible to ensure that if there is a disciplinary case that the local bar association or through the local law society ensures that the discipline function is carried out by a panel to discipline the lawyer when he falls out of line in terms of his function as a lawyer. How does it work in uh, Maharashtra? It is absolutely exactly same. Uh, so we every jurisdiction has uh, the local every state. That's what we call in uh, India. It's every state has their local jurisdiction, uh, their local law society. As Maharashtra and Goa is for uh, Maharashtra, uh, there could be a Delhi uh, Bar Association for Delhi, Gujarat Bar Association for Gujarat. So every state has its own uh, bar association, uh, which is a law society, uh, and uh, uh, that's how they function. Good, good, actually. But I just this quick experience that I had in Gujarat, I met the uh, the president of the Bar Association in uh, Ahmedabad, which is the head office of the state of uh, Gujarat, and the, the registrations of the lawyers and register of the lawyers is kept in that town and for the whole of Gujarat. Just to give a perspective for the Canadians who do not know about India very much, that in, in Gujarat alone is a population of about 90 million people and they have a different language, Gujarati, and uh, then the Bar Association is the Bar Association of that entire state here. They call it state over there. Here is the provinces. That's right. And uh, the president told me that if there was a discipline problem in, in India, it is not uh, in the discipline rules are not as, as vigorously enforced because the profession is very close knit. Like the culture of the society makes the lawyers come closer to each other much more and they are more defensive as against the how the judiciary functions and how the public functions. So in different words, if you had a case of negligence against a lawyer, it would not be easy for you to bring an action in India against the lawyer. And the, and the lawyers would not take on the case to bring a case against a lawyer because of negligence. So there are two disciplinary issues that you have to deal with in Canada. First of all, how would it happen in Ontario? You would report, uh, the lawyer would report the case of a complaint or an action uh, to the law pro who would defend the lawyer based on the insurance arrangement of the member of the bar and he pays the regular insurance to, uh, premium to protect him against the negligence that may happen. But I think that from my understanding, in the Indian jurisdiction, the amount of the insurance amount is not very large. Am I correct? Uh, uh, potentially, I, I, I'm really doubtful whether we even have any insurance in India. Uh, because uh, that's not the general practice in India. We don't have... Uh, 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 like uh, neck, in, like lawyers insurance, like what we have in law pro here. Uh, we obviously uh, pay a membership fees every month or every annual membership fees to the uh, local bar, bar association. And um, the bar association is the main primary body which, you know, looks after the well-being of lawyers or if any, there's any kind of issues with the lawyers or uh, potentially uh, there are any uh, uh, you know, maybe a cases of negligence or complaints or something like that from the clients. So Bar Association is the only body who looks after that. 
but then I really have, uh, I, I don't have any idea if now they have started with uh, any kind of an insurance. But then as long as I was there in India, there was uh, uh, no insurance in place for the lawyers. Well, that's my understanding as well, because I think Indian jurisdiction, the, the lawyer, so to speak, is very in a strong position. In other words, I think if they want to show their protest against uh, any particular complaint of the public or even the judiciary that they are unhappy with the lawyer, then the lawyers are able to come together. And I've heard of a situation where they can boycott a court and say we're not uh, have the members show up in that court. Uh, so uh, I would like to mention one case. Uh, I, I don't know uh, a lot of details about the case, but it's just a, a very, uh, the, I mean, you know, it's very relevant to the topic that uh, once I remember there was some kind of an incident and a lawyer was being uh, arrested by the police and they have handcuffed him. Uh, for some reason, and they were just taking him to the uh, to the police station, uh, you know, ha handcuffing the lawyer. And I I have heard that there was a large number of protest against protest against that particular issue, and uh, uh, you know the lawyers have protested that uh, being a lawyer's fraternity, you should not uh, you know even if there's any kind of a uh, issue because the lawyers are officer of the court, they should be treated with the dignity, equal dignity. You know, it should not happen that their respect and uh, thing is jeopardized by such kind of an incident. So uh, any kind of an uh, uh, such uh, incidences, I mean, these definitely sometimes once or twice it happens, like, you know, some uh, unlikely incidences, uh, you know, which are not very favorable for lawyers. But then what I've seen is like uh, most of the lawyers entire fraternity stands together and protest together. That's, that's very... That's my understanding as well. So... Uh... So in other words, I think the professions of the different states of India are working cohesively together as a group. And it's partly cultural as well, that in Indian culture, the bonding process is very strong, actually. See, the bonding is not as strong in uh, the Canadian provinces where each one person feels on his own. And you will see it in the practice. This is a message to those people who come from the Indian jurisdiction to Canada is that what happens, as you will experience, Sashalak, in this uh, province, that each lawyer will feel that he's on his own. And so yeah. if you are, you know, if there's a fair number of lawyers, I say, just to give you my, my sense of proportion, very big law firms in Can in Ontario, the biggest law firms are in, in Ontario and in the Toronto area. So you might have uh, law firms that have 100 lawyers, 150 lawyers at one time in one law firm. And uh, they support their members. But if you're on your own, like I am, or you, I think you just recently joined a group where Join they the support you yes. if there's any question. And uh, and they're very often in the big law firms, they even pay your the, the law society membership fees. And the membership fees are fairly heavy in this country as against India. And I'm a member of the bar in Gujarat but I paid the membership fee, fee, and to my knowledge, your membership fee lasts forever. I think that, that that's my understanding, actually. So, but here, I just renewed my membership, actually, and then just to give you an idea of the cost. So this is a message to our the lawyers in Ontario who come from another jurisdiction, that my I have a very good record, and therefore I, my premium for the insurance, as well as my membership fees are the, the lowest that you can think of, but it still cost me about $2,600 to be a member of Ontario uh, Association. It's an annual membership fee. And then there, of course, my insurance is a slightly similar amount, slightly higher than that amount per month, so that you're paying those two insurances that total up something like $5,000 plus to just call yourself a lawyer in this province. And uh, so there's a very big difference in terms of the, the responsibility of the lawyer in the Indian jurisdiction and here. So my main message to the lawyers coming from India to this jurisdiction is that here you would have to worry very much on each occasion for the discipline aspect of your practice and make your decision accordingly in a very conservative fashion so you don't offend the rule of professional practice. And most of it is centered around the adversarial system, the principles of independent legal advice are very, very important, actually. In the Indian jurisdiction, it, it is not as vigorously applied because the society is more, uh, you know, more, more, you know, how shall I say, more bonded, connected in the Indian jurisdiction. So I think that the, the insurance deals with the question of negligence. The lawyer in this jurisdiction 
has to worry not only, so I saw the new lawyers, by the way, there is a one lawyer in my group that just joined. And uh, so he was an employee lawyer and now he's on his own and was very keen to work with me because he saw that uh, the, when you come out of the law school in this country or become a member of the bar here, the, he had sensed and he's quite rightly understood that the challenge of being negligent and being professionally wrong can be very high. So there is almost, I can use the expression, even a terror of trying to make a decision. That's why our membership group of the angel mentorship group is aimed at the idea of supporting the lawyers. And, and we've supported, I've supported personally about 24 lawyers who are now all practicing and all successful in their practices and also five paralegals who are also successfully practicing in their own discipline. So I wanted to bring this out because I want to address this video also to the members of the, the Indian jurisdiction who come and settle in this, uh, in, this, in this state, in the province here. So I think let's move on to practical aspect of how do you give advice when you have a client from a, let's say from the Indian jurisdiction and needs the advice in a family law or a state law. So let me just frame the question. I have to give an example, Shalaka, that I have a client who came to, and I got this client from my old classmate from England. And, and she called me from, from your hometown, Mumbai. And she said, would I act for this client? And at this stage of my practice, I'm working with a lawyer, each lawyer who be on the record and I stay in the background and, and advise the client and the lawyer in terms of how to make the decisions and then carry out the case in the court system. But the case was relating the separation that happened in a, in a married couple. There was a child there and there was a big concern, a very big concern in the mind of both the parties when they reached the lawyer, each was saying to the other party that you may go back to India and we might have to continue the action over there. So what we did, but we asked, the, I asked the other lawyer to give me confirmation, the undertaking that this matter would be resolved in the Canadian jurisdiction and that the party would not be going to India and starting another action and, uh, and then following it up over another country because it would be difficult, expensive, because you have to continue your job in this country. And if the issues are very emotional, a person might take the initiative and each person is very concerned. So we use the provision of the Divorce Act in which the residence of one year is sufficient to attach the jurisdiction in the domicile law to this jurisdiction. And we ask each other as lawyers to confirm to the other lawyer that the matter would be heard in this jurisdiction. So I think that is a big concern here and, and I think so, my view is that if you practice in Ontario, the number of people who are immigrants is quite large. Actually, if you look at GTA and uh, Mississauga, Brampton, Toronto, and Markham, Richmond Hill, the proportion of immigrants who have exposure to another jurisdiction and are used to another country and the legal system of another country, when they go to the lawyer, there are totally different thoughts in their minds as compared with what they would think if you were born and raised in this country. So there is a need, in my view, strongly to support the community when they have to make decisions which, uh, which affect the two jurisdictions. You see, for example, so if you're dealing with property law, for example, if you have a property in India, then the jurisdiction of the property, even if you had a will, if you had an agreement the, the agreement or the inheritance law has to comply in respect of the property with the local law because the local law controls the property. So if you have property in India and, uh, and you started a house and you bought a house in this country, then we have two jurisdictions to deal with. But uh, that is why I want to collect the groups of people like yourself who are qualified, have experience of another jurisdiction, and are able to advise the client. So we would have a lawyer that is uh, like you, who is able to uh, deal with two jurisdictions and be able to advise the client. So I think, uh, what is your comment in terms of the usefulness of the lawyer to have two qualifications? Do you think it is helpful? 
for the clients yeah. to have a lawyer who is familiar with both the jurisdictions when there's a client who has property or issues to deal with in two jurisdictions. Definitely. Uh, so recently, uh, even I have come across a, a client uh, who has his father's will and uh, half the property is in Punjab and half of the property because uh, the father uh, came here when he was uh, very young and then uh, the children are born here. Uh, so now after the uh, the uh, the father has passed away, um, he has his will and he has mentioned some of the property which is in India and disposal of the property should be obviously done with the Indian, uh, as according to the Indian laws. And here, whatever the property he has in here, uh, obviously we have to, uh, I mean, appoint the estate trustee and all that uh, things has to be done according to the Canadian law. So if the lawyer who, who is uh, familiar with both the jurisdiction can definitely assist the client in a better way. Yes, uh, I think uh, Sherlock in my is very useful and I hope that anybody from our group or even not in our group would like to join our group is welcome to join if they have different uh, jurisdiction. We are also called to the bar because I think there is a need for that service and uh, that's, that should be supported because it affects the rights of the individual and who needs to understand the rights in both the jurisdiction to make an effective answer. I want to give you one example, Shalaka, that I dealt with then I was first getting to know the Iranian community, which is very dominant in uh, Richmond Hill. So, and like you know, so what happened was that I prepared a separation agreement and uh, put all the normal provisions, which were exactly correct from the Ontario and the federal jurisdiction of of Canada. But then I later learned, many years later, that the the other party was unhappy and commenced a separate action in the Iranian jurisdiction in Tehran. Oh. So then I heard the, the telephone call. Do I have a copy of the agreement? So I looked up the copy and I, I said uh, um, to the person who was actually on the opposite side. And the person on the opposite side was looking for the copy of the agreement, looking to me to get him a, a copy of that agreement. And then I learned that the person uh, had started another action in the jurisdiction because in the Iranian jurisdiction, they do not recognize any foreign jurisdictions, you know, like India would recognize it. Just to, to recap, uh, Britain ruled about 60 countries. Most of them have adopted the common law system, including India. So they have a supplementary probate arrangement, which I'm also doing for one from from Mumbai recently, in which the arrangement is that you issue the primary probate in the country where the person died, so which in this case was, was India. But there's some property in a bank or some cash in a bank which have to be taken out, so there would be a need to, to prepare a supplementary probate in this country. So that system was created in English jurisdiction and is passed on to all the Commonwealth countries would understand and respect this idea of a supplementary probate in another jurisdiction. So you're not creating a separate application for probate, it's only supplementary in, right. in terms of the second jurisdiction where you need to deal with the property. This is an example that I think will come across in many practices of these people who have people in the two jurisdictions. But I think that currently, in my view, there's a dichotomy in the way the profession has registration of foreign people who are qualified in the jurisdiction, but there's no coordination in the way the lawyer gives the advice. He gives the advice only from one jurisdictional point of view, but by hit and miss, you find out that the advice is not sufficient because you do not have sufficient understanding of another country and how that country's courts are going to deal with your client in other jurisdiction. So that's my experience on that issue. So any comments on the ratio? Uh, no, sir. I mean, uh, this is I, I really appreciate this idea because the supplementary probate issue is like uh, so, uh, you know, it, it will save a lot of time, energy. Uh, people have to put efforts at both the places. It will save all of that. So it is a wonderful idea. I think I'll give another example, actually, in terms of the custody and the property issues mm -hmm. is that the grounds for divorce are different. So in other words, if... Uh, if you have a, incidentally, you know, I just give an idea that this is my observation. So this is why I want to create a, a group also 
that will be able to deal with not only to jurisdiction, but other disciplines which are relevant in the solution of the separation problem. Just to look at the statistics in Canada, almost 45 to 50 percent of the marriages are dissolving at some point in time in their lives. So which means that there are large property issues, property of custody, access, and uh, and the support obligations based on the equalization of the property, etc. So, to if you were in Indian jurisdiction, then you would have different grounds of divorce because mm -hmm. India has uh, the the richest law which is brought into the legal format. If you if you're in a courtroom and make an application for divorce, you have to declare whether you're Hindu or Muslim and the jurisdiction or the legal system will apply your religious law to that person. And therefore, if you were, for example, Muslim, I understand that you can marry more than one wife. But if you do that same in, in Canada, you can actually be arrested for bigamy, actually. So these are the drastically different jurisdictions. But the common thread that we have is the understanding of the solution of the problems in the in the point of view of the common law, which is adversarial and says that each person must have their own lawyer to, to support the cause or the cause of action of each person. And the other lawyer will support the, the same thing for the opposite side. And then when you disagree, you solve the problem by asking the court to solve the problem. So when we deal with the, the family law, it is more common now than ever before that there are separations and more and more separations I've seen in the Indian families as well, which is happening uh, in a slightly bigger scale here because the culture here is causing the idea of independence for the women and is causing the tension in the families. And the resulting part is that if you're dealing with the, the family and finding a cause of action to get the separation in a divorce organized, and the person decides to go to another jurisdiction and say, well, I'm more comfortable in India now because I don't want to deal with another country. My family's in this country. And how do I deal with it? Then we have to know the two grounds of divorce in both the jurisdictions. So that is uh, the reason why I feel that the rights are fundamentally affected by the fact that the people have migrated and they do not have the need advice of the two jurisdictions is a good example. So what are the grounds for divorce in the Indian jurisdiction? Uh, so uh, the the cruelty uh, as as here in Canada is cruelty and uh, uh, you know uh, if if the couple is not living uh, living together for a year it's just a separation they can go ahead for the separation and uh, one year separation can lead for the ground of divorce that is also there in uh, India apart from that uh, um, uh, obviously the domestic abuse and domestic violence is also a, a ground of divorce so I think the grounds of divorce are pretty much similar uh, because uh, uh, now the Indian jurisdiction also recognizes these problems uh, as as what I see from uh, from a lawyer's perspective obviously the divorces in Canada the number of divorces in Canada uh, are much higher than what we have in India because India is uh, uh, like it's a it's a it's a cultural difference which also comes a major role in here uh, but then um, uh, as we are progressing and, you know, as we know, uh, women are also uh, are, have becoming more independent and they are, I mean, society is also taking into consideration uh, uh, to looking at the women as an independent, um, you know, uh, 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 individual rather than uh, earlier it used to be just women were dependent on the family and all that. So uh, taking into consideration, obviously, in India also, uh, the the concept of divorce is also uh, becoming uh, you know going into masses but then yeah I mean that that's a cultural difference which probably is going to remain there for a longer time but apart from that the grounds of divorces are like pretty much similar. Good so I think we explored the Hilaka very interesting aspects of what we need to support the client's rights as lawyers in two jurisdictions and I think that it was very helpful uh, discussion I hope that the lawyers listening will uh, will also take heed of what we say. Then also, they want to join our organization. It's called Angel Mentorship Group. It's on the Facebook, and anybody is welcome to join. 
We have launched 24 lawyers so far and helped them to launch their practices. They're from many different countries and uh, most everybody is welcome to join. There is no cost to joining and we look forward to working with other lawyers and I'm very pleased that you participate in this program today. So, so I think we'll look forward to doing more programs that can help other lawyers and help uh, or develop our practices uh, better, actually. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.